Welcome to WorkCare U's training module on bloodborne pathogens. This training session is designed to provide you with a basic understanding of bloodborne pathogens, common modes of transmission, methods of preventing exposure, and what to do in case of exposure. The content found within was created from information from CDC, OSHA, and WorkCare's experienced team of physicians. Let's begin. The idea of contracting a bloodborne pathogen is the stuff of nightmares for workers at risk of being exposed to blood or other potentially infectious materials. The right training coupled with sound precautionary methods can help turn nightmares into more restful evenings and a safe and healthy workplace. Bloodborne pathogens are microorganisms that are present in human blood and can infect and cause disease in people who are exposed to blood containing the pathogen. These microorganisms can be transmitted through contact with contaminated blood and bodily fluid. The list of bloodborne pathogens includes, but are not limited to, human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, non-A, non-B hepatitis, syphilis, malaria, and more. This training program will focus on HIV and hepatitis B and C, which are the bloodborne pathogens that generally pose the greatest risk to workers and are of the greatest concern. However, it is important that you become familiar with the bloodborne pathogens that you may be exposed to at work, particularly in laboratories. Exposures to blood and other bodily fluids occur across a wide variety of occupations. Healthcare workers, emergency response and public safety personnel, and other workers can be exposed to blood through needle stick and other sharps injuries. Mucous membrane and other skin exposures happen on occasion. Why the concern over bloodborne pathogens? In 1990, OSHA estimated that occupational exposures to bloodborne pathogens caused more than 200 deaths and 9,000 bloodborne infections. To help protect workers from the serious hazard, OSHA published the Occupational Exposure to Bloodborne Pathogens Standard in 1991 with the purpose of protecting workers by eliminating occupational exposure to blood and other potentially infectious materials. This regulation, however, does not apply to the construction industry. Bloodborne pathogens are transmitted when contaminated blood or bodily fluid enter the body of another person. In the workplace, transmission is most likely to occur through an accidental puncture by a sharp object, such as a needle, broken glass, or other sharps contaminated with the pathogen, contact between broken or damaged skin and infected bodily fluids, contact between mucous membranes and infected bodily fluids. Other common methods of transmission include sexual contact with an infected partner, sharing infected needles, accidentally cutting yourself with a sharp object that is contaminated with infected blood or bodily fluid, and getting contaminated blood or bodily fluid in the eyes, mouth, or other mucous membranes. Unbroken skin forms an impervious or strong barrier against bloodborne pathogens. However, infected blood or body fluids can enter your system percutaneously through open sores, cuts, abrasions, acne, or any sort of damaged or broken skin, such as a sunburn or blisters. Bloodborne pathogens can also be transmitted through the mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, or mouth. For example, a splash of contaminated blood to your eye, nose, or mouth could result in transmission. There are also many ways that bloodborne pathogens are not transmitted. For example, bloodborne pathogens are not transmitted by touching an infected person, coughing or sneezing, using the same equipment, materials, toilets, water fountains, or showers as an infected person. It is important to know which ways are viable means of transmission for the bloodborne pathogens in your workplace and which are not. 
OSHA requires exposure evaluations based on the potential for job-related tasks leading to exposure. One of the best ways to determine your risk for exposure is by evaluating your job duties. Jobs considered high risk involve procedures or jobs with inherent potential for contact with blood, body fluids, tissues, mucous membranes, and skin contact that could possibly transmit HBV, HIV, or other bloodborne pathogens. Jobs with the most risk include janitorial crews, safety supervisors, emergency response team members, physicians, nurses, paramedics, EMTs, radiological technologists, clinical laboratory technicians, and clinical aides. Jobs with moderate risk include those where employees do not work in situations that routinely involve contact with infectious materials. However, a potential for exposure exists. These jobs include custodians, police officers and investigators, physical therapists, and athletic trainers. Those jobs with minimal risk involve those with no exposure to blood, body fluids, or tissues, but exposure is possible. So how can you protect yourself? Take universal precautions that encourage you to treat all blood and body fluid as potentially infectious. Protect cuts, dermatitis, chapping, and small cracks by using personal protective equipment. Use gloves and have as little contact as possible with blood or other body fluids. So what's your employer doing to help protect you? The Bloodborne Pathogen Standard requires that employers develop an exposure control plan and make it accessible to all employees. You can access this document by contacting your manager. The document is a written plan that identifies the tasks and procedures as well as job classifications where occupational exposure to blood occurs without regard to personal protective clothing and equipment. The plan also establishes the schedule by which the employer will implement other provisions of the standard and specifies the procedure for evaluating circumstances surrounding exposure incidents. The Bloodborne Pathogen Standard specifies methods that are to be used to minimize the transmission of bloodborne pathogens in the workplace. These methods include universal precautions, engineering and workplace controls, personal protective equipment, and appropriate housekeeping measures. Let's take a look at each of these methods. Engineering and work practice controls. Employers must select and implement appropriate engineering and work practice controls in situations where occupational exposures to blood or other potentially infectious materials may occur. The objective of engineering controls and work practice controls is the same, to reduce or minimize employee exposure to bloodborne pathogens. The difference between the two types of controls is that one isolates or removes the hazard from the workplace, while the other reduces the risk of exposure by altering how tasks are performed. Engineering controls are those that isolate or remove the bloodborne pathogens hazard from the workplace. Examples include sharps disposal containers, self-sheathing needles, safer medical devices such as sharps with engineered sharps injury protections, and needleless systems. Work practice controls are those that reduce the likelihood of exposure by altering the manner in which a task is performed. An example is prohibiting recapping of needles by a two-handed technique. OSHA gives precedence to engineering controls over workplace controls where feasible, as stated in a 1999 Compliance Directive, Enforcement Procedures for Occupational Exposure to Bloodborne Pathogens. Note that employers are not responsible for providing sharps containers for employees who use or produce contaminated sharps or other materials for personal medical reasons, such as diabetic employees who use insulin syringes and blood test strips. The employer should, however, strongly insist that the employee bring his or her own sharps container to work to eliminate potential exposures to other workers. 
Personal protective equipment, or PPE, requires the type of protective equipment appropriate for your job and varies with the task and the degree of exposure anticipated. Equipment that protects you from contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials may include the following. Gloves. Gloves should be made of latex, nitrile, rubber, or other water impervious materials. If gloves are particularly thin or flimsy, double gloving can provide an additional layer of protection. If you have cuts or sores on your hands, cover these with a bandage of similar protection as an additional precaution before donning your gloves. Always inspect your gloves thoroughly before putting them on. Never use gloves that are damaged, torn, or punctured. Remove contaminated gloves carefully, avoiding touching the outside of the glove with bare skin. Dispose of contaminated gloves in a proper container. Eye protection. Bloodborne pathogens can be transmitted through the mucous membranes of the eye. Consequently, you should use eye protection whenever there is a risk of splashing or vaporization of contaminated fluids, such as while cleaning up spills or during certain laboratory procedures. Signs, labels, and color coding. OSHA requires communication to employees who may come in contact with bloodborne pathogens. It may include material safety data sheets, labels, warning signs, and training. The warning label must include the universal biohazard symbol and the term biohazard in a color that contrasts with the fluorescent orange, orange-red background. Warning labels must be affixed to containers of regulated waste, refrigerators and freezers containing blood or other potentially infectious materials, and other containers used to store, transport, or ship blood or other potentially infectious materials. Red bags or red containers can be substituted for labels. Contaminated equipment which is to be serviced or shipped must also have a warning label and a statement regarding which portions of the equipment remain contaminated. Housekeeping and waste disposal. Keeping the workplace clean and sanitary is a necessary part of controlling worker exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Cleaning schedules and decontamination methods depend on the type of surface to be cleaned, the type of soil that is present, and the particular tasks or procedures that are being performed. General housekeeping guidelines are clean and decontaminate all the equipment and working surfaces after contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials. Be sure to inspect and decontaminate bins, pails, cans, and similar receptacles intended for reuse which have a reasonable likelihood for becoming contaminated with blood or other potentially infectious substances on a regularly scheduled basis. Also clean and decontaminate receptacles immediately or as soon as feasible upon visible contamination. Handling and disposing of broken glassware. Do not pick broken glassware up directly with your hands. Instead, use items such as a brush and dustpan, tongs, or forceps to clean it up. Sterilize broken glassware that has been visibly contaminated with blood with an approved disinfectant solution before disturbing it or cleaning it up. Dispose of decontaminated glassware in an appropriate sharps container. Sharps containers should be closable, puncture resistant, leak proof on sides and bottom, and appropriately labeled. Dispose of uncontaminated broken glassware in a closable, puncture resistant container such as a cardboard box or coffee can. Response to emergencies involving blood or body fluids. In the instance that you are faced with a spill of blood or body fluids, here are some key points to keep in mind. Wear appropriate protective equipment. Carefully cover the spill with an absorbent material such as paper towels to prevent splashing. Decontaminate the area of the spill using an appropriate disinfectant such as a solution of one part bleach to ten parts water. When pouring disinfectant over the area, always pour gently and work from the edge of the spill towards the center to prevent the contamination from spreading out. Wait 10 minutes to ensure adequate decontamination and then carefully wipe up the spill material. Be very alert for broken glass or sharps in or around the spill. Disinfect all mops and cleaning tools after the job is done. Dispose of all contaminated materials appropriately. And finally, wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water immediately after the cleanup is complete. 
Exposure incidents. Even the most comprehensive infection control program can't guarantee that accidental exposures to bloodborne pathogens will not occur. Human error or unexpected circumstance can result in a sudden needle stick or a splash of blood in an employee's eyes. For this reason, post-exposure management must be an integral component of a complete program to prevent infection following bloodborne pathogen exposure. An occupational exposure should always be considered an urgent medical concern to ensure timely post-exposure management and administration of hepatitis B immune globulin, hepatitis B vaccine, and or HIV post-exposure prophylaxis. If you are injured or exposed, tell your supervisor immediately and perform the following tasks. Clean the exposed area with soap and water for at least 15 minutes. Flush mucous membranes with water or saline for at least 15 minutes. Remember, early treatment can significantly reduce the chances of disease transmission. The U.S. Public Health Service has published guidelines for the management of occupational exposures to HBV, HCV, and HIV, and recommendations for post-exposure prophylaxis which can be accessed at the following website, www.U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Record Keeping Medical records must be kept for each employee with occupational exposure for the duration of employment plus 30 years. The records must be confidential and must include the name and social security number of the employee. It must also include hepatitis B vaccination status, including dates, results of any examinations, medical testing and follow-up procedures, a copy of the healthcare professional's written opinion, and a copy of the information provided to the healthcare professional. Training records must be maintained for three years and must include dates, contents of the training program or a summary, trainer's name and qualification, names and job titles of all persons attending the session. Medical records must be made available to the subject employee and anyone with written consent of the employee, but they are not to be made available to the employer. Disposal of medical records must be in accord with standards covering access to records. For more information about bloodborne pathogens, you can visit WorkCare's website at www.workcare.com or you can visit the CDC or OSHA's website.